Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Today, inshallah, we'll talk about viruses. The next several chapters will be about viruses, bacteria, protists, and fungi. But this is the first time, in fact, we have mentioned viruses in, as we were classifying living things. The six kingdoms that we have described before, two of them dedicated to the bacteria, the prokaryotes, and the remainder to protists, fungi, plants, and animals. Nowhere here have we previously mentioned viruses. And that is because most scientists do not consider viruses to be living things. One important reason for that is oh, that viruses cannot pre reproduce on their own. Viruses are dependent on other cells to reproduce. So they are, if you, were, if, if you find a virus, a couple of viruses, like in the desert in the middle of somewhere, and there are no other living things around, they would not be able to reproduce. Okay, So they are not part of the six kingdoms because... Although controversial, most scientists do not believe viruses to be living things, but they do cause a lot of trouble, as you probably know. Um, so viruses and bacteria is our first uh, topic, but today inshallah, we'll talk about viruses. Viruses in general are very, very small, much smaller even than bacteria. Bacteria are prokaryotes, and they're in general smaller than eukaryotes. Some examples of viruses are measles virus, okay, and uh, the common cold virus, the flu virus, right, pneumonia virus, etc. So their viruses are common, as common as common cold, ha ha ha, because common cold is caused by caused by a virus. You probably, when you were a child, you received vaccination for many viruses like measles, mumps, rubella, etc. And we don't see these nearly as much as they used to be seen before vaccination were given. So vaccinations are very interesting things, and they protect individuals for life because our immune system has a pro pro very long memory. So vaccinations protect us from infections uh, throughout our life. Uh, that's their intention anyways. So measles is an example of virus. This, this child presumably was not protected and they got measles. So what is virus? Viruses are two types. There are DNA or RNA viruses. So a virus can be DNA virus, a virus can be an RNA virus. So all viruses are is genetic material like DNA, RNA, covered by a protective coating that's made of proteins. So a virus is just DNA or RNA, protected by a, a coat of arms, so to speak, a, a coating that's made of protein. So here's in front of you, you see two samples of genetic material DNA. If you covered that with a protein material like that, that's called the coating and that's a virus, basically. Okay. And then sometimes viruses have this protective coating, and in addition to that, they have an outside layer of membrane, like plasma membrane. So they have a third component to them. They're called envelope virus, okay? So they have, a, they have an envelope membrane, envelope, okay? So these are basic types of viruses. The viruses are genetic material covered with the protein coating, and sometimes they also have a third layer, the, a, a membrane type uh, coating. So if you were to cut virus open, you will see that Inside would be the nucleic acid, there would be DNA or RNA, the nucleic acid. And outside would be this protein protective coat, and that's called a protein capsid. It's a capsid, capsid, covering on the outside, get cap. And sometimes, not always, there is a membrane envelope. So this would be an enveloped virus, meaning it has a membrane. Okay? Some of viruses are tiny viruses, like they only have like four genes worth of nucleic acids. Some viruses, on the other hand, have hundreds of genes. So the viruses can be tiny, and viruses can be very big in terms of their genetic material that they carry inside that capsid. So these are the three components of viruses, nucleic acid, protein capsid, and sometimes a membrane envelope. Here's an example. Now, that was a cartoon representation. Now, the, the geometrical appearance of viruses actually is quite fascinating. They're very geometrical creatures and they're rather pretty looking, even though they cause quite a bit of trouble sometimes. So inside of this, as you can see, is the genome. And then outside is the, what you see in the pink here, 
is the protein capsid, okay? And outside the protein capsid is this membrane. Now, it's studded in this membrane, in other words, decorated in this membrane, just like the plasma membrane, are these other things, just like proteins that you see in plasma membrane. So this membrane, just like a plasma membrane, has glycoproteins and uh, 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 kind of decorated in there like, like pictures on the wall, so to speak. Okay? So that's a generic representation. This is a hepatitis C virus, for example. So the virus's appearance is based on the protein capsid, the outside coat. So here's typical virus. This virus is called a helicovirus. It's, it's an RNA genetic material inside, and outside of it, it's like a... Uh, 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 this protein called capsomera here. That's, that's a helical type virus. And this is an icosahedral by the geometric shape of this capsid. And it's a spiking, kind of like cool, you know, don't mess with me type of virus. Icosahedral type of capsid. And this is a, like almost alien looking virus, right? Bacteriophages, they're known as kind of funky looking virus. That's a complex virus, okay? We shall study this briefly. So, these are main types of capsids, and these are some examples. Here's a tobacco mosaic virus. That's a helical capsid, helical virus. This is adenovirus. And adenovirus, you know, probably intimately very well. That's the common cold virus. This is the influenza virus that looks like this. This is the adenovirus, see? Kind of cool-looking virus, right? No one causes cold and causes you to miss school and stuff like that. And this is the influenza virus that causes the flu. Oh, it's a terrible illness, too. And that, that's the envelope virus, see? This one does not have envelope. And here's, here's that alien-looking virus. These are called bacteriophages. Bacteriophages are viruses that, that, that uh, infect bacteria. See, some viruses affect animals, some viruses affect humans, and some viruses uh, in, infect uh, uh, bacteria. So bacteria can infect the different, li different living tissues. And the ones that infect bacteria, they're called bacteriophages. And they're actually quite important uh, for scientists uh, in understanding of uh, different things, non-bacterial, non-virus as well. So here's a bacteriophage. A bacteriophage is a virus that infects bacteria. Here's an example, T1 to T7 viruses that infect Escherichia coli, or E. coli. E. coli, you probably already know. Well, at least E. coli knows you. So, uh, it's a common bacteria. Okay, E. coli is. Now, um, so this is a bacteria that infects virus. It's genetic material. It's in, like, its head over here. That's where the DNA is. And this is a, a, it's protected by a capsid. It's protected by a capsid over here. And then it has this protein coating over here that goes on over here. And then the DNA material is then, see, it's over here. And that's, it's injected into the host cell that it's going to infect. Oh, yes. So the key idea is viruses, all viruses, they need host cells to replicate. Okay? They need other cells to replicate. They cannot replicate uh, themselves. Okay? That's the key. So the first thing it does is the virus, see, it attaches. This is an E. coli cell. And the virus is going to attach the cell. And it attaches to very specific areas. It has to have these receptors. It's like, yeah, it's not going to attach here and there. It attaches very specific areas. And once it attaches, and that attachment allows the bacteria to unload its genetic material. Okay, here's the attachment. You follow? Now, see, why does this bacteria attack this, uh, why does this virus attack this bacteria? The reason this virus attacks this bacteria is because it's able to recognize this receptor. Okay? So, this receptor, now, now, same way, the common cold virus causes its symptoms, it what causes a runny nose and stuff, right? The common cold virus infects Okay, it infects the nose cells, the nasal passages cells, and that's why it causes those symptoms. It infects those nasal passages, right? And why does it do that? And why do the nasal passages cells allow the virus to kind of invite them in? They don't allow them, see? The cells have receptors like this, more proteins like this. They, they are there for other reasons. But the, the virus is, is, has carries with these these 
legs, so to speak, the receptors uh, uh, legs over here that are similar enough that they can recognize this. So the adenovirus, the, the cold virus, affects the cells that it does because there happen to be sufficient similarity between the receptors on the nose cells, the nasal passages cells, and the surface protein of the virus. That is important. It is so important that I'm going to repeat it after a brief pause. Why after a brief pause? For effect. Okay, let me say it again. The reason some viruses of, are of able to infect certain cells is because there is sufficient similarity between the proteins on the virus and the receptors on the cells. And that is the reason why the, the viruses that cause cold affect those passages. They don't go on and affect the liver or something like that, or the brain. Right? But the viruses that are able to recognize the receptors on liver cells, for example, cause hepatitis. The viruses that are able to uh, g go on and, and infect uh, like uh, the brain cell, the meningitis and uh, uh, encephalitis, things like that. So it is this coincidence that uh, between the receptors of the cell and the virus proteins that allows the virus to infect the cells that it does. So here's an entry of an enveloped virus. This virus, see, it has an envelope. Okay, and those are the receptors. Right, and look at this. It's just the, the cell membrane is going to kind of like just become part of the virus membrane. Look at this again. So this is an enveloped virus, a virus that has DNA or RNA material with a capsid and a membrane envelope. Is it, and the virus's membrane envelope is just going to become part of the cell membrane. It's just going to part. And then the virus is just going to come in. It says, knock, knock, who's there? It's me. I say like that. Okay? So this is an envelope virus, and that's how it enters the cells. Uh, this is Denise Foley's Chapman University. Uh, I guess they did that. Thank you very much. Now, once an envelope virus enters the cells, okay, once an envelope virus enters the cells, what does it do? Now look at those receptors, okay? The virus is going to come in. Now here's the virus. That's the, D that's the genetic material surrounded by the capsid still. The capsid is going to dissolve. The capsid dissolves. Now the genetic material is free to do whatever it wants to do. So once the virus is inside the cell, the capsid, the protein capsid, dissolves, melts away, so the genetic material is free inside the cell, and the genetic material does its thing. Okay, whatever it's going to do. Okay? All right. Now what does it do? What does this virus do once it's inside? So once the virus is inside, it can do one of two things, okay? One of two things, not three things, four things, five things, if you keep it simple, okay? It's going to do one of two things. It's going to do what's called a lytic cycle. In other words, virus came and it saw and destroyed the cell and kaboom! It's going to come and take over the cell. It's going to make hundreds of viruses and, the, and the new viruses and, and the cell is going to explode and going to die. That's called a lytic. Lytic is to break, okay? Lytic cycle. Or the virus can do something else something called lysogenic cycle, where it's going to go in a dormant phase. It's going to come in. It's going to go in a stealth mode. Okay, so virus comes in. Here's the genetic material of the virus. This genetic material of the virus is going to become part of the genetic material of the host. And then the virus is going to like go into like a sleep mode. It's going to sleep. And when this cell divides, the genetic material is copied with it. And then whenever the, when it's copied like this, right, it can come out. And then if it wants to, whenever it's ready to cause trouble, it's, this genetic material is going to go over here, make new viruses, and the, uh, the, back, uh, the host cell is going to die. So the first cycle is called the lytic cycle, where the virus, the genetic material, enters the whole cell over here just like this, and it's going to make lots of other baby viruses, and the baby viruses just explode and the cell is dead, and this, these baby viruses are going to go and, and enter other cells. You follow? So that's like, so you can destroy kind of more. Like I'm going to come in and take over the cell. I'm going to make a lot of baby viruses and the cell is going to explode. And those baby viruses go and infect other cells. Viruses can divide very fast. So much so people can get, you know, it's like confused coming, right? You can, like one minute you feel like you're sick and then like an hour later you're like terribly sick from cold and things like that. 
Okay. The second cycle is a lysogenic cycle where the virus goes dormant. So it enters the cell, becomes part of the genetic material, and whenever it wants to, it can resume. So the lysogenic cycle is not forever. You know, what is a virus going to do in this forever dormant? You know, what kind of lazy virus is that, right? So eventually, we would probably go into a lytic cycle, right? So his virus replication by lytic cycle is going to come in here, take over the cell, and it's going to make a lot of baby viruses, and the cell is going to explode. So viral genome is going to enter the cell. Kind of spooky, I think, but that's the way you do it. So here's a viral genome, and it's going to make, it's going to replicate it. It's going to take over the cell's uh, uh, material. Now, how does it replicate itself? It uses the machinery of the cells. The, the genetic material is replicated by the, by the ribosomes uh, and, and the proteins and, uh, and, and, uh, of, of the cell. Now, these capsules that are made, they're protein material. Who makes those capsules? The cell does, not the virus. It's kind of like, you know, all the evil vi viruses kind of takes over. So all the new viruses are formed. The nucleotides that go into the making of the genetic material are from the cell. The, pro the amino acids that are going to go into making the capsid are from the cell, right? And all the enzymes and our ribosomes and all those that are needed to make those genetic material, make those protein capsids, are all from the cells. It truly, really hijacks the cell to make all those daughter cells. And once all those daughter cells are made, the cell explodes and the viruses leave and they're going to cause trouble to other cells. Okay, and you can see how this process can multiply. Viruses can actually make hundreds of, of new viruses in one cell. Okay, now this is a lysogenic cycle where it's going to go become dormant for a while. So the virus genome is then again going to penetrate into the host cell. And then the genome is going to become part of the, of the genome of the host cell. Here it comes. It's a viral genome. It's going to, it's going to go in there. And... At all. See? It's the prophase. So, and then whenever it wants to, it comes out of there. What do you think it's going to do? Make more viruses. That's what it's going to do. It's going to make more viruses and then it's going to explode. Okay, that's the lysogenic cycle. Okay? So, those are two ways viruses cause trouble. So, how do viruses exit? Two ways. Once they just like exocytosis, see? Here, this is a non membrane virus. This virus does not have a membrane envelope. Observe, this virus does not have a membrane envelope. So, this release occurs by exocytosis. This kind of goes out there and ta da, it goes. This, so, this is a non enveloped virus, okay? Um, I th yeah, so it doesn't have to be non enveloped virus. This enveloped virus can also exit via exocytosis. So one way is by exocytosis. A second way is this. Watch, okay. Viruses here's the genetic material with the capsid, and it takes part of the cell's membrane, and that cell's membrane becomes a uh, the uh, the virus's nuclear membrane. So um, uh, so. Here's the virus with the capsid, the protein capsid, and, and the cell membrane becomes part of the, the virus envelope. Now, excuse me for a second. So uh, I have to correct myself. So the virus in the originally here was the genetic material, and that's the capsid. And this was also the um, uh, envelope, uh, membrane envelope over here. And this was released using exocytosis. In this, in the second case here, the membrane envelope was uh, uh, do generously donated by the cell's membrane. Now, it's not that our bodies are helpless, like we fight infections, and that's why we get better from the common cold. If our immune system was not working, the common cold would just be, you know, it's not, it would be like extremely common. You would never get rid of it. But what happens is our immune system does fight these infections. So what you observe over here is an immune cell. So the immune cell is smart, see? It has these receptors for the virus. It knows it. So it says, come over here, and the virus goes to the receptor and the immune cell just takes the virus in because I have a present for you and it's a lysosome and the lysosome attaches to that and the lysosome destroys the virus okay that's what you get for causing common cold so and um so that's how the immune system works the immune system obviously fights the viruses 
right? So viruses here, the immune system has receptors that recognize the virus, and the virus is then uh, endocytosis taken in by the cell, and the, and the virus is then destroyed that way. Okay? Then there's a special kind of viruses. They're called retroviruses. Haha, <laughs> this is a cartoon picture. But there's a special type of viruses. They're called retroviruses. Retroviruses. And uh, HIV virus, for example, is, is, is a, the most well-known, probably, of the retroviruses. What retroviruses are, that they're actually they are RNA virus, but the first thing that they do when they enter the cell is they, tra they transform into DNA. Okay, so they take RNA, which is obviously one strand like this, okay, and once they get into the cell, they use that strand to make a second strand um, uh, like this, okay, complementary. Now, this would be one RNA strand, and there will be one DNA strand, and they will make this into a both DNA strand like this, so they have a full DNA, okay. So they, here's a retrovirus, which means it has an RNA. So it enters the cell, okay. And uh, once it enters the cell, the RNA, it has its own enzyme, reverse transcriptase, which is an enzyme that allows it to change RNA into its DNA. And then this DNA then goes and becomes part of the cell's DNA. Okay. Most viruses, if they're RNA viruses, they stay RNA. They don't do all this funny business into changing into DNA. And if they're DNA viruses, they don't, they are already DNA viruses. So most RNA viruses, they don't change themselves into DNA. Uh, material before they do anything. They stay RNA and they do their thing and they leave. But these retroviruses, retro meaning reverse, this is the only time DNA is made from RNA, by the way. This is the only time, listen, this is the only time a DNA is made from RNA. That's why it's retrovirus. Most of the time, RNA is made from DNA template. But this is the time when DNA is made from RNA template. Okay? So when the virus does want to cause trouble, uh, it, then its DNA serves as a template for further RNAs and to make all everything that it needs. Now, what does this RNA bacterial genome code for? Well, it codes for the capsid proteins, the, en the little enzymes that it may or may not have, etc. It codes for capsid proteins and the enzymes that it needs to do whatever the rudimentary work that it's going to do. It's like a little suitcase of like must-have enzymes in it. Uh, genetic material. So, um, what happens here is here's RNA of the virus, and it's going to make into a DNA. So it takes a single standard RNA, and then it converts it into a DNA. So RNA is going to be converted here to a DNA. You, this is, as I said, a very unique process, and uh, typically does not happen except in the circumstances. And when the virus wants to, it decides to duplicate. So here's an example of the HIV virus. It enters the cell. Uh, this is the viral RNA, and it makes a pro-viral DNA, and the viral DNA becomes part of the cell's genome. When it wants to, it makes the HIV RNA transcript, and then from there, the capsid is produced by hijacking the machinery over here, biosynthesis and the viral application, and then, this, and then it wants to leave, it can exit the cell, and, uh, and the, the membrane generously being donated by the cell's membrane. Here's how HIV virus works. It's an envelope virus. It comes in lands. Now look at those blue receptors over there, okay? Those receptors are going to be recognized by those receptors on the cell surface, and it's going to slow that virus down. And then the virus is going to kind of like go inside like that, see? Once the receptors are recognized. And then once it's inside, here's an, once it's inside, Wait for a second. It will replay over here. Here's the virus. Here's the HIV virus entering the cell, and the DNA is going to be released. It's going to be part of the cell's DNA. And then, when the cell wants to, it's going to produce all genetic material, and the new virus is going to be produced and exit that way. And that's the cycle of HIV virus. Now, HIV virus particularly uh, uh, dangerous, uh, although there is a very uh, 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 effective treatment for it now. It's particularly dangerous because unlike the common cold virus, which affects the nasal passages, etc., uh, uh, HIV virus affects the immune cells. I mean, how are you going to fight the, it's like, it's, it's such a, you know, I'm like, you know, how, how are you going to fight an infection if the virus affects the infection-fighting cells, right? So it causes immune it can cause immune deficiency if it goes unchecked. 
So HIV virus is particularly threatening because it infects the immune cells. So the, some other illnesses are, that are caused by hibernating viruses are chickenpox uh, uh, virus. Okay, now chickenpox and shingles. See, you probably see advertisements for shingles all, uh, on TV and billboards and Walgreens, CVS, whatever, uh, because these are related. What happens is if a child is infected by by chickenpox uh, as a child, okay, and uh, it doesn't have to be a full blown infection, even like this. Okay, and this this kid sees the same person when he's old over here. Okay, so this old old this gentleman over here, when they were a child, they were inf infected with the chickenpox virus. Okay, the the initial infection got clear, but the some of the virus hibernated. Okay, and decades later, the virus resurged. It, it came back in a rash. It typically comes back in a, in a, in a rash in, in, in a certain pattern and certain appearance, and that's called shingles. So shingles is a, a resurgence, a, recur, a, a resurgence of a chickenpox virus when this individual might have gotten it a long time ago. Okay, so uh, shingles is a herpes uh, zoster, um, uh, uh, a varicella zoster uh, rash. Okay. Okay, so uh, that, that thing that's a typo there, okay. Varicella zoster is not herpes zoster. Okay, I guess we will be. Okay, now, coliasis cause other trouble, okay. For example, viruses that in, uh, infect the liver, so this is, they're, they're called hepatitis, they cause hepatitis. So why do virus, certain viruses infect the liver? Because they recognize the receptors in the liver cells, that's why. Well, the liver cells unfortunately happen to be recognized by the virus, uh, uh, virus uh, uh, pro surface proteins. So anyways, if the virus infects the liver, over time it can damage the liver and it can cause cancer. In fact, uh, 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 liver cancer uh, from, uh, from, from long-term damage uh, and exposure to liver from hepatitis B is a common cancer uh, in the world. Uh, fortunately, there's treatment for it, and but, but in a good part of the world, uh, in third world countries, the people don't get uh, the proper treatment, and unfortunately, liver cancer in those people are uh, in those uh, populations is uh, 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 common, too common. Not all viruses are evil, right? And that's all viruses. Virus can also infect plants. So this is a Tobacco mosaic virus, which causes apparently a lot of trouble to people who go tobacco. I don't know why anybody would want to go tobacco, but unfortunately people do. So, so this is a tobacco plant, and uh, the, this particular virus uh, infects the tobacco plant. So even plants uh, can be infected with viruses. And, and you have to understand, plants are eukaryotic cells. They are not like, you know, sacrosanct. Plants get diseases just like human beings get diseases, right? Um, so, um, and on the other hand, look at these. These are called Rembrandt tulips. These tulips are colorful because they have a virus actually so they not all of them destroy the plant some of them cause these some uh, peculiar uh, changes in uh, uh, in the genome of these of, uh, of expression of the genome of these uh, beautiful tulips and they're called Rembrandt tulips now, so not all viruses cause trouble so in some way viruses are uh, m by most uh, scientists not considered living things although they are f fascinating and they're very pertinent uh, to our lives and uh, they, they, they don't have to cause trouble, but sometimes they can. They're very s simple uh, entities. They're made of a genetic material uh, co uh, covered with a protein capsid and sometimes with an envelope. And they need uh, uh, other cells. Uh, they need cells uh, to reproduce, uh, and they can go in lytical lysogenic cycles. Next time, inshallah, we'll talk about bacteria. Until then... Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum.